A very good evening. Uh, request you all to start occupying seats also in the front. Well, at the outset, uh, thank you very much for making it to this evening. Uh, what a beautiful day and a lovely occasion to be in Jaipur. Uh, Literature Festival is very much on. I hope you did get a chance to visit. You did. Wonderful. Uh, so, without much ado, let me just extend a very hearty welcome to Excellency High Commissioner of Australia, Farida Sidhu. Uh, on behalf of Cuts International, a uh, very, very warm welcome to all of you. Um, India-Australia partnership uh, is very, very important, and Cuts has been uh, playing a very important role in uh, the economic domain particularly working with DFAT for a very long time. And we value this partnership uh, uh, more than ever, every single day. It grows. It has grown over the last many years. Uh, so with that, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to invite uh, Secretary General of Cuts International, Mr. Pradeep yeah. Mehta, to deliver his normal remarks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Abhishek. And with that, uh, let me also join in welcoming her Excellency uh, Sidhu to this uh, city and this evening talk. Unfortunately, we are competing with many issues at the moment. There's a literature festival, uh, plus a lot of people who are busy with weddings, uh, too many weddings today. And thirdly, of course, cold and cough. <laughs> many, many people have just sent me a message that, sorry, we are down with cold and cough, so please excuse us. Having said that, let me. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, give you a brief uh, bio of uh, Her Excellency. Uh, she, uh, uh, Harinder Sidhu, has held the post of the Australian High Commissioner to India since February 2016. So she's an old India hand in a sense. <laughs> she also holds the non resident accreditation to the Kingdom of Bhutan. Uh, Harinder brings over 30 years experience in government. She began her career as a diplomat with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which is what Abhishek spoke about, BFAC. Uh, BFAC is a popular acronym for Foreign Affairs and Trade. Many governments, unlike India, uh, combined international trade and foreign affairs in the same ministry, uh, as does Australia. Before her appointment to India, she served as head of the department's uh, multilateral policy division with responsibility for Australia's relationships with the UN and the UN agencies, the UN Security Council, and the Commonwealth. Between 2008 and 2013, I held the post of the first assistant secretary in the Department of Climate Change. Prior to that, she served in several senior roles in the government, uh, particularly on defense and national security matters in the department of the prime minister and cabinet and the office of national assessments. Uh, and has also served overseas in Australian embassies in Damascus and Moscow and was posted to Cairo where she studied the Arabic language. She holds degrees in economics and law from the University of Sydney. <laughs> so, can I uh, request you to please give her a big hand? And <laughs> as as we sent out an invitation, uh, she'll be speaking on the bilateral relations between Australia and India, as well as a recent report uh, done by another former uh, High Commissioner to India, Peter Vargis, who retired as Foreign Secretary. Or Secretary of Defense, 
on their <coughs> Australia's Indian India's <coughs> like a pattern and Australia's and India economic strategy. At the outset, let me welcome Her Excellency Haranda Sidhu, Australia's High Commissioner of India, for gracing this occasion. I also welcome all our friends and well wishers who are with us this evening. Uh, today, High Commissioner Sidhu will deliver her thoughts on Australia-India relationship and the India Economic Strategy 2035. That is the title of the report. Uh, the uh, <coughs> deadline is 2035. It's a good, fat report. She, I heard her speak about this uh, in Delhi at the uh, Aspen Centers, uh, Ananta Centers. Uh, and not only that, but uh, last night I also saw you on TV. Yes. Another friend of mine, uh, Arun Kumar, uh, Arun Singh, I beg your pardon, a former ambassador to the US, uh, speaking about this, among other things, which includes the Australian and the bilateral relationship. Arun Singh is a good friend uh, and also <coughs> advising us on our work in the context of uh, US. <coughs> As many of you may know, uh, Australia and India have a very strong bilateral relation which had been developed over the last several decades. Uh, they encompass areas such as trade and investment, agriculture, education, health, skills development, etc. One can talk about a number of successful examples uh, of Australia-India partnership, and let me articulate just one of them, which may resonate better with today's audience, meant for a lay audience in a sense. Uh, Madam, I'm this is not the daily policy circle as such, uh, yet uh, I'm glad that uh, many of many have uh, been able to come in spite of this inclement weather and so on. Many of you would agree that cricket is like religion in India. Also, Australia is a formidable power of only cricket playing nations. It is so formidable that it took us more than seven decades to defeat them in a test series earlier this month on the Australian soil, seven decades. It was primarily because of the performance of our fast bowlers. And guess what is the most important factor behind the recent success of our fast bowlers? It is their foundation which is being built at the MRF based foundation in Chennai. It was founded in 1987 with the help of former great Australian Dennis Leary. Another great Australian fast bowler, Glenn McGrath, McGrath is now one of the principal advisors to this party. So you know how this partnership has helped us to beat you on your side. <laughs> uh, and it's uh, learning from Australian gurus. To me, it is a successful example of a partnership. In this context, that is partnership building, uh, let me underline two important points. It takes time to build a partnership. It's not an overnight affair. And a partnership is a positive sum game where both the parties should be happy. Now coming to India's today's topic, Australia and India are collaborating on a number of areas as I said before. This includes a partnership at the sub-national level in the state of Rajasthan. Between Rajasthan and the province of South Australia. Given many challenges that our state is facing, be it making our agriculture more resource efficient, particularly in enhancing the water use efficiency or in developing better healthcare facilities, or in enhancing the skills of our youth. I'm sure that this partnership will be improved. This is sort of the broad agenda of the partnership between the state of Rajasthan and uh, the uh, province of or South Australia in Australia. At the national level, by trade and investment relationship between Australia and India is going at a fast pace. The long-term vision as articulated in Australia's India Economic Strategy 235, 2035, clearly outlines a roadmap we're turning our relationship into a partnership. After all, we are two largest democracies in the Indo-Pacific region. And I underline the word here, Indo-Pacific, for those of you who may not be familiar, but this is a new word which has come into the jargon, as against what used to be called Asia-Pacific. I'll come back to that later. 
Well, we are looking forward to hear from the High Commissioner on some key elements of this vision document. Let me underline that both the identified flagship sectors, which is education and the lead sectors, agribusiness, natural resources and tourism are extremely important to the long-term growth and development of India. Other than these four factors which I spoke about, the document has identified six promising sectors. This is the India Economic Strategy Report by Peter Vargas. Uh, these are energy, health, financial services, infrastructure, sports, and science and innovation. In all these sectors, India is making significant progress, and we are looking forward to further that with the help of Australia and other like-minded countries in the region. Now, when I said like-minded countries in the region, what is also happening is uh, a kind of a geo-strategic move in terms of developing a quad, India, Australia, Japan, and US. Uh, for several reasons, in order to <coughs> ensure that there is a freedom of navigation uh, across the sea lanes, which are so important for all of us, including particularly Australia, most of the trade which goes to these various uh, seas uh, surrounding our nations is extremely important. And that is under some kind of uh, pressure from a growing superpower, uh, which is China. Uh, the US is quite candid about it, quite blunt about it, but both India and Australia have a different view on this particular issue. For us, for both of us, China is a very big trading partner. And for Australia, it's probably the biggest uh, trading partner. Uh, and for India, it is going into a bigger trading partner. It's also being invested in India. A lot of people uh, may not know this, but they are investing a huge amount in India, which is what is required. We were talking a bit <coughs> at the little while ago in terms of the BRI, the uh, Border and Roads Initiative, launched by China and as to how it is becoming a dominant force in many parts of the developing world, particularly in South Asia. Talk about something which is, I heard at the Lit Fest, there was a session on South Asia. Uh, the fact is that this is happening, it doesn't mean that you know, it would necessarily lead to some kind of dominance. And the world has changed, this is the 21st century, it is no longer the 18th century, the 19th century uh, when you could get away with uh, many things. Uh, yet, in this particular calculus, as it were, uh, India and Australia have a strong understanding about these issues and to see as to how it can forge ahead with, uh, in that formation of Quad, uh, Japan and US included, and as to how to as I may, I may take this opportunity to speak to you about uh, cuts uh, launching its Washington DC center precisely to uh, look at many of these things in April, uh, 19, uh, April 2018. When this issue was uh, discussed and we had uh, the Australian ambassador, the Japanese ambassador and the US ambassador, all and the Indian ambassador, all four at this particular launch meeting, which physically uh, uh, spoke about the factors that how important it is that uh, the Quad moves forward as a force to be reckoned with. Given uh, the kind of uh, autonomy which each nation needs to exercise uh, in order to ensure that its own interests are protected. With that, let me welcome uh, Your Excellency once again and, and over to you. Thank you very much, um, Pradeep Mehta, Secretary General Katz, um, for your very, very warm welcome. Thank you, Apishek, for all the arrangements and your very generous um, uh, welcome as well this, this evening. And a uh, very warm thank you to everyone at Katz. Um, as uh, Pradeep said, uh, we have a long-standing uh, relationship with CUTS as uh, the Australian Government and as the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and CUTS has over many years I think been a, a real advocate for 
um, really a clear-eyed, objective look at economic and trade policy. And I think that it's a very important voice in a world where uh, I think policy is becoming increasingly contested. Uh, so, um, so I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk to all of you. I especially appreciate um, Pradeep's mention of the crickets. I'm so glad we've got that off the plate. Um, can I uh, extend a very warm welcome, to, uh, warm thank you and congratulations to the Indian um, team, but also obviously to all of you at the great victory in, in Australia. It was well deserved and I think every Australian would applaud uh, the great sportsmanship and the great skill we saw on the field. Um, we will have words with Dennis Lilly about what he has done to build <laughs> in the future. And uh, thank you all so much for coming here too. So I'm so pleased that what I see before me is the most robust uh, group of people, people who have braved traffic, colds, coughs, bad weather, um, you've ducked weddings and uh, ducked out of them or found the time to come here and you've managed to avoid uh, the great drama uh, that is the Jaipur Literary Festival and to take a little bit of time out to hear me. So for all of that, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm probably going to cover a little bit of the ground that, um, that Pradeep has just covered for us, but um, perhaps give it my own sort of framing. And so if you'll just bear with me, I'll, I'll just walk you through where we are on the economic relationship. But it can't be said that, uh, uh, we can't look at an economic relationship in isolation. Um, I think both of us were at the Jaipur Literary Festival today and it's, an, it's an, a forum in the Literary Festival where people talk about current issues, the way they see the world, their aspirations for the world. And it's very, very clear that um, we cannot isolate a conversation about economics from a, a conversation about the political relationships between countries at the moment. Um, so, you know, for example, um, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, to start with, is a concept that's often called geoeconomics. Where we are in the world today is a world where there is an interplay between the strategic and military and political and diplomatic relations between countries and the economic and trade relations between countries. So I cannot talk about the Australia-India economic relationship or any economic relationship in isolation from what is happening in the world around us. Earlier this month, in fact, only a couple of weeks ago, Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Maurice Payne, delivered a keynote address at the Racina Dialogue in Delhi. And what she did there was she outlined Australia's very strong commitment to an open, prosperous, and stable Indo-Pacific region. And we, we now refer to our region as the Indo-Pacific. For a long time, we used to talk about the Asia-Pacific. But what we've started to recognize as Australia, perhaps over the last decade, is that we are a country which faces uh, east and north to the Pacific and to our west to the Indian Ocean. So describing our region as the Indo-Pacific actually makes a lot more sense and it's very uh, realistic in the current environment. For example, 40% of Australia's trade and exports exit through our Indo Indian Ocean ports, for example. So we can't just see ourselves as a Pacific partner. Um, now, the way we look at this, if we want to have a stable and prosperous and open Indo-Pacific, this is clearly a commitment that's shared with India. Prime Minister Modi has spoken about it many times, including at the Shangri-La Dialogue last year. That is our aim. But it, we're saying this at a moment when this region is undergoing a dramatic transformation. It's a time, as we speak, when economic relativities between countries and strategic relativities between countries are moving. For a long time, through the 20th century, we actually had quite a stable international scene. You knew who the 
great powers in the world were the United States and Russia and Europe. Um, and we had a, a number of developing countries and we had a number of what we would call middle, um, middle power countries, such as Australia in the process. Two decades from now though, this is the period where the India economic strategy looks, like, looks at. The world is going to look very different from that picture. China is predicted to overtake the United States by 2030 as the world's largest economy in market exchange rate terms. India, which is of course the fastest growing major economy in the world at the moment, is expected to become the world's third largest economy in US dollar terms by 2030. And we'll see all these relativities change as we go along. We know Indonesia is going to grow to be a very significant economy in, in uh, the next two decades as well. The change in the economic position of these countries will have strategic consequences. It only makes sense if you have a large economy, you will want to, you know, have your say in how the world works. So by 2020, though, one of the things we see um, is, is that economic size starts to get correlated with military budgets. By 2020, the combined military budgets in the Indo-Pacific will probably exceed 600 billion US dollars. This means that uh, Indo-Pacific countries will match the military spending in North America by 2020, and that's rapidly going. India is a very large arms importer, for example. What we're seeing in this geoeconomic world is that economic power is being used for strategic ends. And this is why we call this geoeconomics. It's a concept that's increasingly important in the way we understand Indo-Pacific dynamics. And of course, inevitably, Australia's economic and strategic interests in the world start to become intertwined. We believe that um, our economic and strategic interests are best served by deepening regional economic integration in a way that maximizes growth. What we uh, advocate is open trade and investment based on market-based principles. That's why we committed to concluding a regional comprehensive economic partnership, RCEP. You may have heard about this. This is a, a trade agreement that includes ASEAN, India, China, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand. And the logic for a trade agreement with those countries is, as you can see, this is an Indo-Pacific trade agreement. It will create effectively uh, a reason, an open but connected trading relationship amongst all the countries in that region. We know that trade and economic relationships actually underpin stability because you're sort of connected to each other and you have reasons to have a stake in keeping that trade open. We also recognize the um, importance of sustainable infrastructure development. So Australia, for example, has a long-standing investment with the World Bank in South Asian infrastructure and trade facilitation. To build on this work, um, our foreign minister at the Raisina Dialogue also announced a new South Asia Regional Infrastructure Connectivity Initiative, which we're calling SARIC. SARIC's first pay, uh, phase, which will be worth about $25 million over four years, will focus on raising the quality of investment in regional energy and transport infrastructure. A well-connected South Asia is a South Asia that is, you know, in some way united and that can actually be quite strong, economically resilient. And we'll be drawing on our uh, reputation for innovation and infrastructure policy, including, for example, on asset recycling and public-private partnerships to contribute to building connectivity in South Asia. And I know that CUTS has done a great deal of work in this area, so um, it's certainly something that aligns very well. So um, what does this mean about Australia and India? This is the world where we're, we're in. Building connectivity, building links is actually going to um, create more stability. Australia and India, of course, are very both very strong advocates of prosperous, stable, and open, and rules-based Indo-Pacific. 
what we're seeing is that the combination of these shared values and our deepening people-to-people -people links make India a very important partner for Australia. So much so that in 2017, the Australian government's foreign policy white paper for the first time placed India at the front rank of our international partnerships. India is just assuming a bigger, bigger place, a bigger importance for all of us. Um, we saw two-way trade between Australia and India increase to 29 billion Australian dollars in the 2017 to 2018 financial year. This sounds really good. India is our fifth largest trading partner, but let me just give you uh, a reason why we think it could be better. $29 billion sounds like a lot, but it's only a fraction of what it could be given the potential in this market. So, you know, it's worth noting that at that level, Australia's trade with India is exactly the same as Australia's trade with New Zealand. Uh, and it just intuitively doesn't make sense, you know that we can do better than that. So that's why the Australian government commissioned this independent report by Peter Varghies on an India economic strategy. We sat there and said, this is kind of, you know, this is, could be so much better. Why are we not doing more with India? Why is India not doing more with Australia, given the relative size of both our markets and the potential there? Also, what we discovered at the time was that we couldn't seem to have the language to talk about how to build an economic relationship between our two countries, because we would the only way we could talk about that was to talk about a free trade agreement. Free trade agreements are really, really important. They provide political as well as commercial underpinning that give confidence to trade between the two sides but they're not the whole of an economic relationship. They ha there has to be more than just an agreement between two countries. So Peter Varghese was commissioned by the Australian Prime Minister to provide an independent report on how we can build our economic relationship with India. And what he delivered was a 20-year time frame strategy, and he did this for a very good reason. If you look at a strategy that comes out for the next two years or five years, you are inevitably looking at what you can do inside a single political cycle. What you want to do is you want to deal in trends. You want to look at what you have to get to 20 years from now, and then what is the path to get there. And that, I think, allows you to have a different conversation, a less policy-oriented, politically-oriented conversation, but a more practical conversation. The second thing that we have to do is that we need to um, be able to find a way to cement India in that space as one of our top economic partners. Over the next 20 years, Australia will be very, very well placed to provide most of the goods and services that India needs if we look at where India is going to be in 20 years' time. At 6 to 8% growth per year, India is going to uh, there are going to be limits to what India can supply itself to, to keep fueling that growth. And Australia is, some, uh, is a country that has a lot of uh, experience in partnering with developing countries. We've done this repeatedly in uh, other parts of Asia. The India Economic Strategy, therefore, um, really is speaking to an Australian audience. Uh, it's written for an Australian business audience that really doesn't quite know how to go about dealing with India. India is terribly complex, it's very diverse, it's quite uh, difficult to find a very simple way in, where do you start? So what it's, it sets out to do is it sets out to provide a very practical roadmap. If you are going to be able, to, wanting to do business with India, here is what you might have to look at. So it does a few things. First of all, it it sets out a series of very ambitious goals. It says, well, what do we want to be in 20 years' time? Well, in 20 years' time, it says India should be one of Australia's top three economic, uh, trading partners. So up from number five to number three or two or whatever. The second thing it needs to do is it needs to, India needs to be a destination for Australian outward investment. Uh, we are not a great investing country, Australia. We tend to be a bit like India, 
short on capital in our own country. Um, but one of the things that Mr. Varghese recognised in the report was that uh, opportunities for investment in India have opened up much faster than opportunities for trade. And he felt that this was something we need to capitalise on. The third thing um, Mr. Varghese suggested was to bring India into the inner circle of Australia's strategic partnerships. And this is quite significant because of what I started with, talking about the relationship between strategic partnerships and economic partnerships, and that the strategic and the economic just go together at the moment. And finally, uh, Mr. Varghese suggested that what we needed to do was to have to build people-to-people -people links as strong and as close as any in Asia. For too long, I think, the entirety of a conversation about Australia and India, and particularly when it comes to people-to-people -people connections, the entire conversation has been about cricket. It has been quite remarkable to me to think on arriving here, to see a country where actually I see so many similarities with Australia, so much alignment with how Australia is, and so much potential for us to connect together across the wide range of sectors that we don't seem to have made that connection as deeply as we could have. And if I have an ambition, it is to take our relationship between the two countries to the kind of relationship that is as close, close as any that two countries in Asia can be. So the people-to-people -people dimension, I think, is going to be a very key part of this, uh, of this uh, relationship as we go forward. Mr. Varghese put 90 recommendations in his report, and I'll, I'll break that down in, in, in a moment about what they're all about. Um, and the Australian government actually um, adopted those 90 recommendations pretty much in their entirety. Um, he, what he did in providing this roadmap is to say to Australians, there's a few things you need to do. You need to look at India as uh, a collection of states and not as a single country. Um, where, you, you know, so you, so understanding that every state in India has its own personality, it has its own strengths, it has its own um, features, and it has uh, different complementarities with Australia. And what we needed to do was to look at what each state could offer on a state-by-state -state basis. In that report, Mr. Varghese identified 10 priority states. So he said, out of the 29, if you're going to start, here are the 10 that offer the most potential, the most prospects, the fastest rate of growth, the closest complementarity to Australia. Um, and it's not to say the other 19 don't matter. The other 19, uh, as he explained, probably had very much more niche uh, connections with Australia than the broad scale ones. But this is speaking to a novice audience. The second thing Mr. Varghese did, as, as Prateek mentioned earlier, was to, <coughs> to give Australians to focus on 10 major sectors, economic sectors. And, uh, and uh, he named education as the, what he calls a flagship sector. And the other three sectors were uh, resources, agribusiness, and tourism. And then he had six promising sectors, which included energy, sport, um, in a whole bunch of other health, a whole bunch of other sectors where we think Australia can start to make inroads. Uh, <clears throat> now, the, why did Mr. Varghese pick education as a flagship sector? <coughs> if you look at the way that Australia's trade with India is constructed, a very large part of our trade with India is in the resources sector. Um, most of uh, something like about a third or, or nearly half of what we sell is metallurgical coal to India for steel making. Uh, gold, copper ores, the sorts of things that India t then turns and adds value to in a developing country sense is, is what, what we sell. <clears throat> but education has been a growing part of the relationship. Most of you would see an education relationship as the movement of students from one country to another and going to Australia to study. And that's true, that's happening. There are 85,000 Indians studying in Australia at the moment, and uh, that number keeps growing from year to year. On a 
between last October and the October before, the numbers of students going to Australia from India rose by 29%. So there's a dramatic uptick in the numbers of students going to Australia. Um, Indian students are finally starting to discover just how high quality Australian education is. We have six universities in the top 100 our universities in the world. Um, so, and given that we only have 43 universities in Australia, that is an extraordinarily high proportion of our universities that sit in the world's top 100. Um, and then we have uh, quite a number of universities in the next 100. So we are really, really in the, amongst the world's top ranked universities. Uh, certainly my family background is Southeast Asian, and uh, for, for Australia, Southeast Asian countries have long gone to Australia in recognition for many decades about the quality of education that exists in Australia. That's number one. But the other reason why education is a flagship sector is that in almost every other sector we can think of, the education relationship is what opens the door to a business relationship. Um, let me give you an example. In Jharkhand, this is not a uh, not Rajasthan example, though I could probably cite that too. In Jharkhand at the moment, um, at the Indian School of Mines, we have an Australia-India mining partnership. That the, the foundation of that mining partnership is a relationship between the Indian School of Mines in Jharkhand, in Dhanbar, and uh, Curtin University in Western Australia. And they've brought the mining expertise of both of these uh, institutions together to start to develop training, to start to develop, um, build technology, to start to uh, really kind of bring the two countries' expertise together. In the process, we started to see commercial <coughs> engagement between the two countries because this now forms a platform for trade and economic relationships to build. So in recognition of that sort of and, and that repeats over and over again. We have a sports partnership. Again, Australian universities are the leaders in that sports partnership. If we're looking at um, uh, water, which we do with Rajasthan, and I'll come to that in a moment, there is a very big uh, research and development dimension to that, which is again brings the education sector into that, into that sector. So that's why it really ends up being a really important sector. Uh, the other sectors, of course, uh, come together. Now, if you have 10 states and you have 10 sectors, you can see how you can start to map states and sectors together. So much so that if you're a business person in Australia and you're saying, I work in uh, water management, uh, I build pumps and pipes, where would I start in India? you would look at that report and that report would say, well, uh, these five states are the most prospective in terms of the, the way that you could work with Australia on water, for example. So it actually does, it goes down to quite a granular level of detail. It is a practical business guide, is what it is. It's not an academic work. So it's proved very successful I conducted a roadshow for two weeks around um, Australia last year, um, talking to Australian business about this report, and there is a phenomenal amount of interest in the Australian side on this. I'm very pleased to see that the Indian government has commissioned a reverse report, because of course, you're never going to be able to build an economic relationship if one person's doing all the work and there's no nothing coming from the other side. And so the Indian government has also embraced this and is building a report uh, on how India can engage better with Australia. And I really welcome that. I think it's wonderful. Before I started this evening, I did have a conversation with some of you, and there's a lot of interest about the people-to-people -people dimension of our relationship. So I just want to say a word about the Indian diaspora in Australia. The report, and I do commend it to you, it's available online, it's, very, it's a public report, um, does have a whole chapter about the Indian diaspora in Australia. We've seen that diaspora grow quite dramatically over the last decade or so, so fast indeed that um, we've seen the numbers of Indians living in Australia triple in the last 10 years. For the last two years in a row, 
Um, Indians are the largest source of skilled migration to Australia. And um, we now, in the latest census, we saw that about 450,000 uh, Australians are Indian born and about 700,000 700, Indian, uh, 700,000 people in total uh, have Indian ancestry. Now, to an Indian person living in India, 450,000 does not sound like a lot of people. So let me put this in context in language that you can understand. That equates to nearly 2% of the Australian population. What that means is one in 50 Australians today was born in India. And that means that Indians are actually having a very sizable impact in the Australian system. They, found, they form a backbone and an ability for us to uh, build a long-term sustainable relationship between our two countries. And that's something that's very welcome. I'll just move very briefly before I conclude to uh, the South Australia-Rajasthan relationship. Rajasthan is, of course, one of the states that we look at in the report. Um, and an important part of the India economic strategy is to say states should work together. The, one of the other great similarities between Australia and India is we're both federal systems. We both have central governments and we have state governments. So South Australia is one of the six states in Australia. We have six states of two territories, um, and Rajasthan, of course, a state. And some, about three years, four years ago, Rajasthan and South Australia signed a sister state relationship together. Um, and uh, this has led them to develop partnerships in a number of areas of mutual interests, the most important being in terms of water resource management. Rajasthan is the driest state in India, South Australia is the driest state in Australia. Australia has world-class water management. We can produce uh, some, we're huge agricultural producers coming from a country that has the lowest rainfall on earth. And so uh, how do we do that? We do that by very, very cleverly managing the little water we have. And there is a great deal that we can share in terms of the technologies and the techniques that we have uh, developed over the many years. But equally, I was talking to someone just a couple of days ago, there's much we can learn from India about how um, India has also evolved some of its um, uh, water management. In fact, it's very telling that uh, uh, one of Australia's early prime ministers, our fourth prime minister, Alfred Deakin, visited India in 1893, if my memory is correct, uh, and he was m very taken with the similarities between the challenges in Indian agriculture and the challenges in Australian agriculture, so much so that he wrote a book on irrigation in India in the 1890s. Um, he was absolutely convinced that this was an area that we can have uh, a great partnership in and certainly the coming together of South Australia and Rajasthan in this area is most commendable. This is a great partnership we have established here together with the Rajasthan government, the Rajasthan Centre of Excellence for Water Resource Management, which we call RACEFORM, and, uh, and that is proving to be a hub for shared projects and shared approaches, and I'm genuinely hopeful. In fact, I spoke to the, um, the new Chief Minister, Mr. Gellot, only yesterday, and, uh, and he's very keen to look at what we can do to uh, advance the work that's being done there, perhaps lift it up the level. So that's really, really excellent, and I'm really happy to see that. Now, I can go on all night because, of course, you've got me talking about my absolutely favourite topic, which is the Australia-India relationship, but I think I might just leave it there for now. I'm very happy to answer your questions, if you have any, and, um, and to talk at length about any topic you'd like. But can I leave you with a couple of thoughts? One is my firm belief that Australia and India are natural partners, uh, that we should do so much more together than cricket. And the fundamental important thing that sits underneath that is that we need to understand each other better. We've got to move away from outdated ideas about each other on both sides. The India economic strategy has many virtues and one of the things it does 
is it gives to Australian audiences a contemporary picture of India. What would be very great, I guess, is if we were able to do the same thing in return and build a contemporary picture of Australia in Indian minds so everybody can see what I can see, which is that there is a great scope for collaboration and unity between our two countries. And I look forward to doing what I can to be a small part <coughs> to making that happen. So thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent, uh, uh, how should I put it, call to the toast. <laughs> and yeah, go to the, uh, what have you. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to uh, respond before opening the floor that half my family are Australians. And that happened, that happened because of education. My son-in-law went to study in Bond University and then Fallen in love with Australia and is now an Australian citizen, along with my daughter and his. The other thing which you may not have heard, Peter Wagner <coughs> once told me, and I can see the effect of that, is the Australian master chef is so popular in India. And I don't know why. My family that watches this very avidly. That could be a very good uh, <coughs> way to you know get get Australia into a, <coughs> into our homes. That when I, can I open the floor for any questions and answers? Please do identify yourselves. <coughs> yes, please. Uh, hello. Nimra? Swati? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that you did a good job. Can you identify yourself, please? Okay. My name is Naren Bakshi. I'm from Jaipur. I live in Silicon Valley in the United States. I went there 52 years ago, and I've seen growth of Indians there from very, very minute. Where I live, we used to have only 1,000 Indians. Now we have 500,000. So you can see that growth can happen, and that's what this is. <coughs> so my question to you is, in America also, even though lots of people have been going, when you look at the percentages, it's only about 2%. Just like what you said, we have maybe four to six million Indians there. Uh, but they seem to be very, very uh, into big cities. Hardly any Indians live in smaller towns. They also tend to be in few sectors. You can see tons of doctors, you can see Technologists, you can see hotel model people. So, can you give us some guidance in terms of how the 450,000 people that are there, what are they doing, and what sectors they are able to make a progress there? Can we take a bunch of questions? Any other questions? Comments? Abhishek? Well, well, my apologies, I missed my own introduction, but thank you, Pradeep, for acknowledging it. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, uh, also, thank you for a very comprehensive breakdown of India-Australia economic partnership. Uh, in the context of Indo-Pacific, and looking, in the, looking at the India-Australia economic partnership, uh, when we look from the Indian perspective, we have a bilateral with US, we have a trilateral when Japan comes in, we have a quad when Australia comes in. Uh, in the context of Indo-Pacific, what are the points of departure when the quad comes in vis-a-vis -vis the bilateral, and what are the points of convergence uh, in this relationship? Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Hi, good evening. I'm Shepra Sharma Putani, and we are working with international placements. I just want to understand there is a lot of requirement for skilled manpower in Australia. And in India, we are struggling with the problem of unemployment. 
So there are two questions I want to understand. How much support do you give in immigrations of this uh, skilled youth, which I am talking about? They are not so literate and they are not aware of the social dynamics of Australia. And the second one is like, do you have labor problems because we have supplied some manpower in UAE and later on it was a lot of struggle was there, a lot of problems were faced. So, and if we want to supply because the manpower we are having are all skilled and verified and validated by government of India. So, and they are really good and they can be uh, tested in different uh, parameters also. So how we can take it forward and what support does the government gives in this regard? And take one more question before turning to you. Yes, please. To the bank. Hello, I'm Ode. Hello, I'm Ode. Am I audible? Yes. I'm Ode Mehta from Cards International. Uh, Your Excellency, extremely interesting, uh, I think, interventions. Uh, I have a gen uh, just a general question, not specific to India and Australia relationship. Given your presence, would like to you know, get your opinion on this. And my question is, with this whole rise of protectionism, which is happening in the developing world, and with the US, uh, which is clearly not pretending anymore to lead the world, and you have China on the other hand, asserting its own you know, position at a global level, how do you foresee the global <coughs> order and the world order changing reshaping itself in the next 10 years. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. They're really good questions and very thoughtful, all of them. Thank you. Um, I think I might do this by... Um, I might take the strategic questions together and then I'll talk about the immigration questions. It needs to fall in into those two um, categories. Um, Abhishek, and uh, your question about the quad versus the bilateral. Where the quad comes from, and I, I think uh, you know, a lot of people hark back to 2007 when we had sort of a kind of a false start, I suppose, is what you'd call it. Um, the world today, now that we're looking at the world at the Indo Pacific, we're seeing a world where all the countries in that region are playing a slightly different role, but in fact, sometimes quite a dramatically different role to where we were 10 years ago. And we've, over history, particularly since the Second World War, we've evolved different mechanisms to maintain stability, to keep countries talking. The one thing we know is that the, the, the best way to diffuse potential um, conflict is to build understanding. And you can build understanding by giving people forum, or countries forums in which to have these conversations. Um, so we started with the United Nations immediately after the Second World War. In recent years, in the 80s and 90s, we went to regional organisations, you know, APEC or um, the East Asia Summit more recently. Uh, there's IORA in the region, etc. Those all serve a very valuable function. Why? Because they bring countries together that are, are closely located, that have a common interest and a shared way of looking at the world. I think what we're looking at now is uh, uh, two dynamics. One is uh, a dynamic where uh, everything is moving faster and it's moving in a more complex way than it ever did before. So even an organisation like the G20 or the EAS may not be able to be as agile as we would like it to be. We're seeing a real proliferation of what we're starting to call minilateral uh, engagement. Uh, and what we see is the dynamic changes. Um, when you're in a bilateral conversation where, say, Australia and India sit down, it tends to go often to the nuts and bolts of what makes that relationship work between the two of us. Um, you know, the conversation starts, I mean, you'll cover the whole waterfront, you'll start talking about um, big, you know, military joint exercises together, all the way down to um, the clearance for Indian mangoes to be sold in Australia, which, by the way, we have cleared and you can sell Indian mangoes to Australia now, so I'm very happy to say that. Um, when you start bringing other like-minded countries together, by the time you get to a quad or a trilateral even, your, your conversations start to be about those things that those four countries <coughs> share, their, their common interests, their common concerns. And uh, you tend to be sitting much more in a strategic space. So they have, for example, and this is no secret, they've talked about counter-terrorism, they've talked about cyber issues, they've talked about the things, all the challenges that we're all facing in common. 
It is not the case that they sit there endlessly and obsess about China. Um, it's not to say they don't talk about China, but they, there is a wide range of issues. But that once you put four countries in a room or three countries in a room together, they start to discover what it is that they have in common. That discovery and that ability to recognise that there are other countries that we have shared interests in common provide you with uh, a group of countries that you can go to for those specific issues. So that's really what distinguishes it from uh, from a bilateral, for example. It's becoming a very useful mechanism. People have got very excited about it, but actually I, I'd say the Australian government is very comfortable with the way that it's progressing, uh, step by step, steadily building a, a relationship and deepening understanding amongst those countries. And we do it with many different combinations of countries, uh, not just that particular uh, combination. So that's, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Mr. Meta, your question also a very good one about the rise of protectionism. Uh, I think we're all very concerned about this and I know Cuts has been really at the forefront of uh, arguing uh, about the dangers of rising protectionism. Uh, it's no secret where Australia comes from. We recognised a long time ago that the best guarantee of Australia's prosperity over the long term was open global markets. Um, uh, and and uh, that's just been our recipe for prosperity. We unilaterally dropped our tariffs quite significantly in the 1980s and 1990s. Australia has very, very low tariff rates at the moment. Most of our tariffs are nearly at zero, uh, with the exception of a few handful of commodities. Um, we have a very wide network of free trade agreements with other countries and we are big advocates of this and we know that when countries trade together they're invested in each other and that actually also drives stability. Where do I see it's going to go? I'm afraid my crystal ball is not working. I don't actually, I, I don't think I can predict. Um, but I do think that unless countries like India and Australia step up and not just be vocal about the importance of open trade but act in that manner and do and refrain from ourselves moving to put up walls unless we actually show that by example and India can play a very important role here given the size of its market um, others will retreat also into their shell we do need to keep the the voice and the advocacy for open trade on the, on a level uh, so uh, that would be my answer to that um, there are an, a couple of uh, questions around uh, immigration and the diaspora. Um, I think the simplest way to answer both those questions is in a simple way. Um, there, the distinction between the Indian diaspora in Australia and that that you've seen in, well, many places is, um, but say, let's just for argument's sake, say the United States is, the Indian diaspora in Australia is a much more recent diaspora. In fact, uh, my family, uh, we're not Indian born, we're Indian origin, but we moved to Australia in the early 1970s, so getting on 50 years ago now. Um, and at that time, there was a very small diaspora in the country. Um, there were pockets of Indians, uh, including a small community uh, farming community actually in uh, northern New South Wales, um, but really very, very spare. In the last 10 years, we've seen a real uptick in that, uh, in the immigration. Uh, all our immigration regime, whether it is for permanent residence, whether it's for temporary work, is built around a skills requirement, um, which means that we conduct quite sophisticated surveys of our labour market we look at where demands for skills lie and where there is a shortage of the skills that are in demand. We compile a publicly available list, a uh, skilled occupations list, and we uh, uh, encourage immigration where it fits those skills occupations. We don't tend to, um, we don't tend to uh, bring or encourage people. We, we don't go out and bring people in. People apply themselves and come in. Uh, they come 
we do not tend to have on that list unskilled workers. It's only uh, really generally people who have particular skills. In recent years, it has been largely IT workers. We do have a shortage of people in that sector. Um, but equally, um, a wide range of skills, teaching, nursing, um, aged care, child care, there's a wide range of skills that are, that are out there. They change from time to time, of course, as the labour market needs change. It's meant, and that is a system we've had in place for many decades, and what that's meant is that we've been able to use our immigration program uh, as a way of supporting our economic requirements in the country, as well as obviously creating a good social mix, um, uh, which has been, I guess, the happy accident that's come out of all of that. But we've always been able to attract very highly skilled migrants to Australia, simply because of what Australia can offer in terms of a life and a lifestyle. All those migrants, without exception, have made a tremendous contribution to our society and our economy, and they remain very welcome and they're very valued members of our society. Thank you very much. Any other questions on we call it today? I have one question, which is, yes, is, uh, is one of the sector which is very prominent for tourism uh, in Australia as well as uh, Rajasthan, both have very similar similarity in the tourism. What the kind of handhold which we can have in these two parts of the uh, bilateral trade which has been signed? I think there has been some issue, uh, uh, subject matter which was signed between the government. So has anything been, I don't find anything being done in that direction. Thank you. The picture out, just behind you. Uh, I'm Vikram Gocha. I'm from the industrial sector in Rajasthan. Uh, my question is uh, uh, for Her Excellency. Uh, are you uh, satisfied with the amount of connectivity between India and Australia? Because uh, I see very scant direct flights uh, between the two countries. And what do you think would be the road ahead uh, in that light? <laughs> Uh, is there any other question? Uh, we'll take the last question from my colleague here. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Ripul Chatterjee from Cuts International. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your speech. I think it was excellent. Uh, I'm sure that uh, I have two observations uh, to make and, and also related suggestions. I'm sure that your India 2035 strategy will be successful. And the manner in which you have explained the sectoral approach, state focus, etc., etc., and the granular. Incidentally, in 2034, we are going to celebrate our 50th anniversary. Very, very consistent. So we are going to jointly celebrate that the success of your 2035 strategy and our 50th anniversary. I'm looking forward to that. Too. Now, in order for your strategy to be more successful, I have two couple of examples. Sorry. One suggestion. While well, uh, you have this partnership with Indian School of Mines, uh, and I'm sure that they are getting new technologies, etc., uh, etc., et it would be good to have a partnership between Australian Productivity Commission and the Indian Company. You see, productivity, skill development, this is one of the major areas where we are struggling. So if we can, I have seen the work of the Australian Productivity Commission, including visiting them a couple of times, the kind of work that they do. So that will be a, another, in my opinion, will be a successful example, or can be a successful example of Australia in their work. My second and final point is, I'm glad that you emphasized or underlined that under your SARIC program, uh, this quality of infrastructure, Connectivity is the new buzzword. We require connectivity, good and better connectivity in South Asia, particularly in Eastern South Asia and in the Indian Ocean region, the Sri Lanka and beyond. So I'm glad that you are emphasizing on the quality of infrastructure, the kind of investment that we need in trillions of dollars. We do not have the capacity to manage that. So public-private partnership, how are we to manage that? Thank you. Along with that, I think it's very, very important to involve people on the ground for them to understand 
and the importance of infrastructure development, importance of connectivity, and how they can align with that. So they're looking for us to work with you on that, on that aspect. Thank you, Vibhut. For me, the most critical <coughs> thing is the unpredictability of Trump. And that has a huge impact on many, many things that we discussed today. Over to you. Thanks very much. Um, Mr. Chatterjee, um, to be honest, um, we're going to have to bring you in as an advisor to the Australian Government because we clearly think alike. Uh, on the Productivity Commission, you'll be very happy to know that we actually do have a heads of agreement between the Productivity Commission and Niti Aayog. And so we bring, uh, we have staff exchanges between them uh, and uh, that's proving to be a great meeting of minds actually. And I think it's working extremely well at the moment. Um, and of course, yes, of course, if you're interested in the connectivity uh, issues, we're in the process of designing, it's just been announced, of course, so we're just in the process of designing that, and, and of course, we'll be reaching out to partners to, to work with us, and, and by all means, do that. Um, I can't read my handwriting now. Uh, oh, okay, just taking the other issues. Could I, um, uh, I think it's worth, uh, oh, sorry, on direct flights, um, I, look, I share your pain. I have to travel between Australia and India all the time, as I understand so do you, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely puzzling to me, actually, why uh, a, a tourism market that's growing at the rate it is, um, and, uh, we don't have more direct flights. Um, I understand this boils down to commercial decisions that airlines make, and I have in, I've been arguing for it, Peter Varghese's report has a specific recommendation that we should encourage direct flights. We certainly do, but airlines will make their decisions on their own commercial basis, and I have discovered that airline economics don't seem to work the same way that the rest of us seem to work. So um, all I can say is I'm fairly confident we will see more direct flights as time goes on. It, the sheer numbers just go in that, in that direction. Uh, I hope it comes sooner rather than later. There is a great deal of interest, I think, on both sides. It's just sort of making that happen. We now have an open skies agreement with uh, with India. It was signed last year, so there's now effectively no impediment for that for that to take place. And finally, on tourism, uh, in response to your answer, a couple of people have mentioned this notion of handholding by government. So um, perhaps it's worth explaining how the Australian government works. We don't hold anybody's hand. Uh, 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 it's not the style of how we do business in Australia for the Australian government to fund or subsidise or, uh, or support a commercial enterprise. Uh, our philosophy is very much, if something has value, it can be done commercially with no intervention by government. In fact, we believe that so strongly because we feel that the best outcomes happen when governments don't get in the way. So, uh, so what we see as the role of government is very much to put a framework around it to create the right environment, but actually to leave business to do its own thing. If there is going to be tourism development <coughs> between India and, and Australia, the government might provide a bit of sort of high level support towards that. But the tourism operators themselves are the ones who are going to have to do the work. Um, the same goes with um, with your earlier question about um, uh, about skilled migrants. We don't bring people in. People come of their own accord. They come on their own merit. They have to meet the criteria. And when they do, um, they make it on their own in Australia. We don't hold people's hands when they arrive in the country. Uh, we assume that people have the wherewithal to do those. To, to do the things that they need to to function in the country. Of course, Australia operates very differently from India. Um, uh, it's a much more systems-based, much more transparent system, um, perhaps a bit more predictable, I think, than you find sometimes in, in India. So it, it, it isn't as challenging as it seems. I can understand if you were in India needing to have that support because of the complexity of the systems here. It's certainly not the case in Australia. So, uh, so it is a very different market. It's a very different way of operating. But uh, we expect Australian business to manage on their own as we expect everything to happen in return. So where we enter into partnerships, the governments are saying, we give this our blessing, but actually 
uh, and we will provide the right incentives. And providing incentives is a good thing to attract the right uh, players and participants, but the government won't do it for you. It is for you to take it up. And, and I think you'll agree, uh, all of you, uh, that that is always what leads to the best uh, result. It generally me means smoother and more efficient operation of business and commercial enterprises, and, uh, and that's what really drives results in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, let me uh, uh, call this uh, meeting to an end with a, uh, another round of applause for uh, <laughs> uh, an excellent uh, speech and the, the interaction which followed. And I'd like to thank not only those who are sitting here, but including thousands of viewers uh, who would be watching it on uh, through Facebook Live. So we put it out uh, uh, so that we could get a very large, uh, and has we, the Australian High Commission has also uh, sort of relayed the thing on his Facebook. So we were glad that you know, a lot of people would be watching this. And there would be a YouTube also uh, of this particular talk. Uh, which can be seen at a later date. May I now request uh, uh, Swati so to please uh, uh, the small token of our pressure. It's, it's, it's quite, actually not small. It's, I it's to say this. Jaipur Portly. <laughs> so <you see. laughs> That's lovely. Thank you. It's very generous. Thank you very much. Well. And uh, there's, there's a, a friend of mine, Mr. Kumawat, uh, who would like to gift you a painting that he did, he's got done of him. Of me? Yeah. <laughs> I think he should have found someone more beautiful. <laughs> it's very kind of so. he, he is a publisher, uh, he's done the media house here, and does a lot of uh, books, including he will probably give, give you one of his books. Yeah. This is a book, Joy of Punjab, oh, on really? 350 year celebration. He published this book. Wonderful Prime Minister, ex Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, he released this book. Oh, how lovely. In this book, we compiled 19 countries, 100 eminent Punjabi. Fantastic. Have you covered? Have you done it? Not so far. No, we are coming with the next edition this year. 550 year celebration of first Guru, Dundanak Devi. Yes. Oh, very good. Should I get down? I yeah. Get down. Careful. Towering over you. Yeah. Set up. Thank you. Thank you very one, much. One, one small. What else? Oh, okay. my. Welcome <laughs> to Pink City. Lovely. Except, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's very good of you. Gosh, it's lovely. It's a great memento. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I, can I invite you all to join us for dinner? Thank you. Thank you very much.